Well, I want to welcome everybody here. I want to welcome those online. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you. My name's Austin Savangren. I'm a father of five kids from a wonderful wife here, married 18 years, and I try to win souls everywhere I go. That's just, I mean, the kingdom of heaven is like fire shut up in my bones. And my main prayer for today is that fire gets shut up in your bones. Listen, if you want to live a kingdom-filled life, you got to start doing. Jesus says, go, not stay and pray. Listen, you can pray all you want, but at some point, you got to say, amen? And the Great Commission is go. So today, let's go. Daddy's in the house, and I ain't playing with you, okay? <laughs> Uh, I want to talk about some cool things that Hungry Jim's been doing in the community right now. We had 29 people saved in, in uh, the last week in service. Uh, 354 kids were in attendance in the Unashamed Clubs in eight high schools. <laughs> Pastor Zach, I'm trying to get these adults to come after you. Listen, we can't leave it to the youth to be winning these souls. Listen, the youth... Adults have the ability to, it's going to sound bad, maybe help the kingdom advance a little bit more financially. Amen. Thank God for the youth. But, but we, want, we want to take the kingdom of heaven into all places of the world. And uh, it's not just for the youth. It's for your coworker. And it's also that the gospel isn't just for those that, uh, that are down and out with a cardboard sign. The gospel is for your coworker. The gospel is for people that look like they have it all together. Amen. The older you get, the better we get at faking it. So with evangelism, I want to go to a quick scripture real quick. You know, evangelism a lot of times used to be done like this. This is Psalm chapter 50, verse 22. Repent, all of you who forget me, or I will tear you apart, and no one will help you. Repent, all of you who forget me, or I will tear you apart, you who forget me. Amen. So that's, that's not my style of evangelism. I try to win a soul before I win the soul. He who wins souls is wise. Amen. So you got to win a soul a lot of times before you win a soul. What does that mean? You win them over to you. Well, you win them over to your character. You win them over to the consideration that you show towards their life. You win them over to the love that they feel around you. You win them over to the kind words that you speak to them in life. Amen. We are people of the kingdom of heaven. We got to release the kingdom of heaven wherever we go. How do you do that? Come to church. These sinners are all going to hell. Listen, you got to show notice and love people. You guys want to hear a pretty wild story? Okay, so I'm at Hill's Restaurant about 18 years ago. I'm a new disciple. I'm fired up for God. I'm discipling a guy that's like mid-40s. It was kind of weird for me to kind of try to help give guidance for a guy that's older than me. I see my bro in the back. What's happening? And, and uh, he, he, we're at Hill's Restaurant. My back's to the restaurant. I can't see anybody. And a guy comes in on crutches. And uh, the guy's disciple is like, hey, you should go pray for him. I was like, who needs prayer? Matter of fact, I probably should go pray for somebody in the restaurant. Are you challenging me? So, of course, I get up and I walk over to the table. And uh, I introduce myself. And it was two older guys, like maybe 60, 50, 60s. They look rough. And the one that had crutches, I said, hey, can I sit down? And then he's like, yeah, sit down. And I said, I sat down. I'm like, hey, so uh, I came over here because I'm a person of faith. And I'd like to pray for you, pray for your leg. At that time, I looked down and there's no leg. Okay. The dude had gotten ran over by a train and there's no leg. So I'm like, well, it's pot committed now. Let's see a leg grow back. So I just lean into it. Amen. Because the same power that live, that, that everything that Jesus did lives in me. And I got to get to the point in my life at some time where I actually believe it. And I get out there and I step out there. Right. So I, uh, I press in, I lean into it and he didn't, that was not the right response for him. He did not want his leg to grow back that day. 
And he did not want to see me anymore. And he began to get belligerent and pound on the table. And like the silverware's shaking on the table and the ice is rattling in the glass. And I'm just sitting there tripping and he's yelling at me. His buddy's telling me to go. And I'm like, I'm trying to go, but the dude's yelling at me. I don't want to just walk out while someone's yelling at me. I'll take my lumps like a man. How many of you guys do? No, you can't just run away when people are yelling at you. So I finally am able to bow out. I turn around. My disciple's gone, right? <laughs> Guess who drove? So he's out in the car. He's got the car warmed up for me. So I get in the car, and I'm just so ashamed, and I'm sick to my stomach, and I'm just thinking, oh, Lord. What's going on here? And uh, I'm like, dude, why'd you leave? He's like, well, what I thought, I thought what you were doing was wrong. You told me to go pray for him, <laughs> right? I get home, I get out of this car, I go upstairs and I crack my Bible open and I was in the book of Romans at the time and Romans 15 says the reproaches of those that reproach thee fell on me. And I realized that his anger was that God and the God in me, not me. And what he truly needed healed for was his heart towards God. He had had a bad experience, bad experience with God. God didn't show up and answer what he wanted. So now he was angry at God. And the greater miracle than a leg coming out would have been a born again spirit right there. And that is the greatest miracle that anyone could ever experience is somebody getting saved and born again. Listen, a leg's going to die. That person's eventually going to die. That body's going to be transformed in a new body. So who cares about a missing leg if you're going to miss eternity? You know, I think a lot of times it's easy for the church to overlook the importance of evangelism. How many people in this room or in the second, second, second sanctuary or online were invited to church by a stranger in the past seven days, raise your hand. Not one hand. Not one. I'm not going to ask how many of you guys invited a stranger to church because I'm not trying to bring too much heaviness on you. But it's important. You know, according to Bible.org, 95% of Christians have never led another person to the Lord. That's staggering. That's a staggering figure. Now, it's probably a lot different here at Hungry Gin. I mean, we're, we're on fire. We're trying to do the work of the Lord. Romans 10, 8 through 17 says that if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. It goes on to say, verses 10 through, or 14 through 17, that how can they ever get saved unless they hear? And how can they hear without a preacher? Right? And a preacher is not what I'm doing right now. That word preach means to openly proclaim something that's been done. How many of you guys all know that everybody in this room can openly proclaim something that's been done? It's called the gospel. We can all do that. It's not Austin with the microphone or, you know, Pastor Vlad bringing that heat. You know, that, this, this is not what that word preach actually means. It means to openly proclaim. And we got to get to the point to where we care people, we love about people enough that we care about their soul and eternity. And I want to give you guys a few methods on how to get into that today. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You got to hear it. The last of the five physical senses of our body to go before we die is hearing. Isn't that awesome? You can look that up on hospice.org. They encourage loved ones to talk to their loved ones right up into the point of death. It's almost like God loved everybody enough to where they could hear in their heart up to the last second and accept Jesus. Even if they're in comatose and they're alive in their spirit, share the gospel. If you guys got somebody in those critical moments in the last stages of life that you don't know if they're saved, they can't move, right? They're not running away. I mean, I'm not trying to be too, too wild, but guess what? You get in the gospel, especially if it was like a mean dad that always said, you know, hated religion. Like, guess what? You can't move, dad. You get in the gospel now. I'm trying to get you into heaven. There was a, uh, a prank going around years ago where they would convince a little kid that they could be invisible. Did anybody see this prank? And it's kind of a funny prank. 
parents and older people would put a blanket on a little kid and they'd say, okay, we're going to say this magical word or whatever they'd say. And then we're going to lift the blanket off and you're going to be invisible. And they're like, you want to do it? Yeah. I mean, who, wa- who wouldn't want to be invisible for a while? Would anybody want to be invisible for a while? Yeah, I know what you know. You don't need to be invisible for a while. I'm trying to sneak around. So they do this. They do the thing. They lift the thing off. They pretend the kid was invisible. Hey, where'd you go, Johnny? Johnny, where'd you go? Johnny's like, I'm right here. And then they think they're invisible. And it was fun for only a short time. And then the kid began to cry. They began to get scared. They felt invisible. They felt like they weren't seen by people that should have seen them. They felt like they weren't noticed by the people that they noticed the most. And that's one of those things we as Christians, we need to be the ones that are noticing invisible people. The title of my message today is They're Invisible and It Makes Them Cry. They're invisible and it makes them cry. I just, I see this world and I just can see the incredible desperation to be noticed. The world has gone crazy trying to be noticed. If you just do this, if you just adopt this identity, if you just join this club, if you just succeed to this level, if you just do this, then you'll be noticed. And so many people get there and and some of the things that they're doing to children and their bodies are irreversible. And if you just do this, you'll be noticed. And maybe you get noticed in your school. Maybe you get noticed in the workplace or maybe your bank account gets noticed for a while, but then it just becomes normal. And the true noticing that people need is they be, need to be noticed by a Christian who has the words of life to impact their soul, to get into their kingdom of heaven. Amen. That is the true riches. Point number one, let's get them. Let's get them. Be intentional and aware. John chapter four, verses 35 through 38. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Here's a quick side note. If you aren't experienced in a victorious, faith-filled, power-filled life, and you want to blame it on a pastor, and you got to bounce from church to church, I'm not being fed, I'm not being fed. Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. And a lot of times Christianity gets boring and stale, and you're just more worried about resisting sin than you are living for God. That is a horrible Christianity. You get bounced back and forth, but if you're all in, God's going to have you busy. You're going to be feeling experience of life and life abundant. You're going to be impacting souls and seeing people's lives changed. You're going to have so many people around you. You can't sneak around and get played played with sin, right? I mean, you guys know, uh, uh, as a great pastor, as a well-known pastor, you just can't walk out of the store carrying a case of beer anymore. Too many people know about you. When you're living for God and you put it on blast, it 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 is actually a safety mechanism for you. Live on God. Put it on blast. Just don't be the workplace weirdo, right? We don't need a workplace weirdo. And, and if you're here and the workplace weirdo has turned you off a few times to Christ, take a fresh look. Listen, the guy was weird before he got saved. God's working it out, okay? <laughs> Anyways, our food should be to do the will of God, not get here from your pastor. Here you go, tiny bear. Here's a little, here's a little bite of food for you. Real men of God and real women of God and real the youth of God, they get into that Bible. They hunt. They're out there bagging game. They're getting wisdom, revelation, knowledge, and understanding. They're rolling in something. They have fresh manna to give. They are on fire for God. They're, they're, they're gangsters for the Lord. Listen, people are more passionate about their, listen, my daughter joined softball last week, practices six days a week, right? And most people don't bat an eye at all of their, all of the sports and all of the stuff kids have to do. We got to be more passionate about the kingdom of heaven than the world is for, for their distractions. We got to lift up our eyes and look. So anyway, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Verse 35. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? 
Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for the harvest. So fields are white for the harvest. Do you think Jesus is talking about going out and getting grapes and figs and apples and oranges and all this stuff? He's talking about the fields are white for the harvest of souls. It goes on to say that Jesus, uh, um, we enter into other people's labors and it's time to be a reaper. He asks for the church to pray, pray for laborers to go out in the field. Can you be a laborer? Amen. I, I feel like one of the greatest things God could ever say to you other than well done, that good and faithful servant. You walk around in heaven with the crown that says laborer. What's up, homie? Laborer. Right? I'm a laborer for the Lord. You know, some of us are going to get to heaven and we're going to have a crown. We'll get a little crown. It's going to be the size of a mole. And, you know, when it comes time to cast our crowns at Jesus' feet, we're like, dink. That's all I did for you, Lord. Dink. You know, we got to do a little bit more for the Lord. And I'm telling you, anytime you sacrifice and lay down your life to serve the Lord and get out there and impact people's lives, you will find real life. We got to notice people. We got to genuinely notice people. Uh, walking into Winco a few years ago, lady's coming out. She's got a big old pack of, uh, of cup of noodles and a big old pack of top ramen. And I'm like, I know that budget. You know, I know that budget. And if you're here and you know that budget, just be faithful to the Lord. He's going to change that budget. You, you serve God. You're going to be surprised at the things that God's going to do in your life, Right. So just be faithful in the small things, like making it to church, going to life class, destiny training, getting plugged in, and God will do the rest. He will take care of you. You seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. Everything else will be added to you. Anyway, so uh, God's like, hey, go bless that lady, because I notice. When I'm at the supermarket, I'm I'm in the workplace. My eyes are open. I'm noticing. I'm noticing people's pictures in their cubicle, their kids, their hobbies. Listen, I try to become all things to all men to win some. Amen. I'm willing to not, listen, nobody really calls me, hey, Austin, how you doing, bro? What's going on? When I start up conversations, I just ask trigger things to get stuff going, and, and I hear people's heart out, right? We need to be listeners, not a bunch of talking. Slow to speak, right? So we got to be great listeners as the body of Christ because people are important. They're important to us. They're important to other people. And you, you don't want to be that one that's just always talking. Oh, here comes sister bucket mouth and brother run his mouth, <laughs> right? So anyway, God's like, go bless her. I'm like, well, I normally keep a crisp 20 in my pocket. And, uh, I broke it for some reason. So I only had like 12 bucks. I was like, eh, I'll let this one slide, Lord. I do this all the time. And I get to where the carts are at Winco and Richland. And he's like, go bless her. So I turn around and tell my wife, hey, go shopping. I'll catch up with you. I go bless this lady. And I go out there and I can't find her. And she's way out, almost by Jack in the box. You guys go to Winco and Richland? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Her car's way back there. And I walk out there to her and uh, I said, hey, are you a person of faith? I always ask that question before I bless somebody because I want them to know you're about to get blessed and it's because of God, right? This ain't the universe. This ain't good vibes. This ain't good thoughts. All that modern day, blah, blah. This is the kingdom of heaven coming at you right now. Amen. So you a person of faith? (laughs) God, you She was crying on the way there. She parked in the very back because she had no gas. She had no money. She was buying the food for all of her, like eight kids for that weekend to try to make it through the weekend. She's crying out to God on the way there and parked in the very back because she didn't want to run out of gas looking for a spot. We have to lift up our eyes and notice the fields and the harvest is white. The people that you think are the most hostile need it the most couple of terms I like to use when I just break conversation. Hey, I noticed I'm in a gas station. Somebody's pumping five bucks of gas. How many of you guys have been on that $5 a gas budget? You pull out of the parking lot, run out of gas again. <laughs> I'm just saying, I don't want to get political, but we'll just leave that alone. It's my first time preaching. Okay. So I like to use the word I noticed, I noticed, and then you could notice anything about people, and it means a lot to them. Another thing I ask, hey, are you a person of faith? I get into 
talking about faith. Uh, one of my favorite ones is let me pray for you. I can count on my, uh, d- dude, I've done this a lot. I prayed for a lot of people in public, my wife and kids right here. Sometimes they're like this again, dad. And the nice thing about being aware, awakened and open to the public and your family seeing it is they realize dad takes this serious. It imprints the value of the kingdom of heaven on their soul. Dad's willing to step out and go do this and do that and do this. And just when I was buying this suit coat, I ministered to the girl. Just when yesterday we were looking for clothes for my son at Burlington and I prayed for a total stranger. Yes? Okay, he's right here. You see, he nodded. Five bucks, bro. (laughs) Five bucks. And then after you, so if you ask somebody, hey, can I pray for you? Let me pray for you. Then you got to bring that heat. I'm not talking about a little fairy prayer where you're playing, oh, and you act like some dork, right? I did that for you, Sherry. You don't act like, so, you know, you know you, when you pray, pray your heart out as if, as if their life depended on it because it very well could. I have had so many people break down in tears because I hit that smoke, right? I'm praying for marriages. I'm praying for addictions. I'm praying for lost loved ones. I'm praying for their finances. I'm praying for hope and joy. I'm praying that their future gets blessed. I'm praying for wisdom and direction in their life. That, that, let me pray for you. Ain't just a little, ah, ah, tag, you're it right? We're, we're the kingdom of heaven. We got to capitalize on these opportunities. So be intentional and aware. Number two, listen with purpose. I kind of hit on this already a little bit. First Corinthians 9, 19 through, what is it? 23 says, apostle Paul's making his plea, become all things to all men that you may, might win some. Be a chameleon. Listen, it ain't about you, and don't be disingenuous. If you guys think that I'm just like up here being like, oh, just listen to people and try to trick them into the kingdom of heaven, you haven't seen the amount of fasting and prayer and love, and you don't know that, that how, how much this heart will be for somebody if they're willing and they're open, right? That's the heart posture that you need to have towards this. We got to listen. We got to listen. I'm not going to make an excuse for having ulterior motives. Guess what my ulterior motives are? to get them saved, to get them in the kingdom of heaven, to get their marriage restored, to get their kids off drugs. My intentions and motivations are pure, but when we're talking, I'm thinking, where can we get Christ involved in this situation? Amen? Well, that's too much, Austin. You mean you're always doing that? Not really, but maybe, probably with you guys. Listen, I'm, I am focused on this kingdom of heaven. It, I'm intentional. I'm out there trying. I'm a hunter. You know, we got, we got hunters out there that spend more time sighting in guns. Listen, I, I'm trying to be a, I'm trying to be a Marine Corps sniper for God, right? And I want you guys to be that. I want you guys to begin to uh, feel the heart and feel the spirit of evangelism. What do you guys think God's favorite ministry is? Yes, Pastor Vasily, saving people, evangelism. What's the best day of most people's lives other than getting saved? The day their kids were born. What do you think God loves? Well, let me ask you by scripture, because anything I ask, I want to have scripture behind it. There's only one where Jesus leaves the 99 to go get the one. There's only one where all the heaven rejoices over one sinner repentant. And there's only one where the father is running towards somebody. And that is evangelism. That is getting souls saved. If you're in the online chat, say, write down in there for me, please. God's favorite ministry is evangelism. No offense to all the other ministries, but when babies are born on earth, it changes everything. That's the most important thing. Everybody loves that. Now, I've been to some pretty cool Christian heavy metal concerts. That's like number one, marriage day. Kids are like number three or four, okay? Sorry, guys. (laughs) We have to have some conviction. That brings me to my third point. We have to have conviction. You cannot just share the gospel again like some... Uh, well, we're just holding the fort till Jesus comes. You know, do you want this Jesus? Then you can dress all plain and be boring and, and, and not have that good a life and just, 
listen, we have to have conviction in the kingdom of heaven. We have to have that fire. Where does that come from? Secret place time. I'll give you an example. This is something that God gave me in my secret place time. Mark 15, 34. Jesus cries out on the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I was worshiping, and I was thinking about these things, and I was, I was down at his cross at my house, you know, and, and just, just really pressing in on this and thinking about the gravity of that moment. And, and, and I, I, in my spirit, not in my nasal passages or in my ears, in my spirit, I began to smell the blood of the cross. I began to hear the pains and the cries and the hammer smashing down. I felt, I felt what it cost for you to get saved. That's why. Listen, it is so much more powerful than we think when somebody gets saved and it costs God so much more than you could ever imagine to get born again. And guess who has the ability to get people saved? We do. Evangelism means to proclaim something, to proclaim something good concerning Christ, the finished work of Christ. How can, how, how can people hear this if, we do, if, we're, if we're not the ones preaching? We got to open our mouths and share, right? So as Jesus dies on the cross, he calls out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Typically, almost every other time Jesus represented or referenced God, he called him. Anybody? Father. It wasn't until he was forsaken that he called him God. Jesus called God God so we could call him Father. Jesus experienced the rejection and separation from God so you could be drawn near by his blood. Listen, when, when, so when I'm sharing the gospel, I have a lot more in my spirit and I know a lot more what's going on as this interaction's happening than just, hey, I'd like to talk to you about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Listen, I'm gonna talk to you about death, burial, and resurrection. I want to talk to you about all of the angels of heaven watching over everything and the very, the very purpose of all creation happening on a certain day. There's a little something more when you're able to share with that type of conviction that impacts people, that wants them to believe what you're saying. Amen? We got to have some passion. Where's that smoke at? Right? We got to bring that smoke. We got to bring some fire to the table. And that happens by being in the secret place. It happens by being in the secret place. God seen Adam and he realized it wasn't good for him to be alone. So he put Adam into a deep sleep, made an incision in his side, took out a rib, formed Eve. Jesus Christ on the cross, put into a deep sleep, died. An incision was made in his side as a spear went through and stabbed his heart. Typically symbolic of birth, Blood and water flows, and out of the very heart of Jesus Christ, blood and water flowed for his wife, for his helpmate. Let's help him. Let's be his body on the earth, right? It's one of the greatest types and shadows of all time. The church was born out of the very burst, speared heart of Jesus Christ. Everywhere we go, we need to understand 2 Corinthians 5, 20 through 21. We are Christ's ambassadors. What does that mean? I'm walking around, kingdom of heaven in me. What's kingdom mean? The king's domain. So wherever I'm at, the king's domain, that king, the kingdom of heaven's domain, his dominion is now in the room. That's why Jesus says, wherever you go preach, preach the kingdom of heaven is at hand. No matter what was going on up in here before I got here, guess what? New kingdom. If it was demonic, if it was full of gossip, envy, strife, guess what? New kingdom's in the room now. We are his ambassadors. As though God is pleading through us, come back, 
come back to Christ, we have to be his ambassadors in his workplace people and live in this type of life. You will be filled. You will, you won't be needing just a little, here you go from your pastor. It's amazing. Pastor Vlad loads me up with steak and everything I want, every service. And I just, it's an honor to be here, but you got to be doing the work of God to get the food, right? Doing the will of God to get fed. Leonard Ravenhill says, five minutes into eternity, and we'll wish that we had sacrificed more, wept more, loved more, grieved more, prayed more, seated more, and given more. Five minutes into eternity, you'll be thinking, what, what was I doing? Are you serious? Like I should have, I could have. You'd be happy to be there. Our walk on by luxury is gone. Our walk on by luxury as Christians is gone. We can't just walk on by people and pretend they don't exist. They're not invisible to us. Point number four, awaken to urgency. Matthew 13, 25 says, talks about while men slept, the enemy came in and sowed tares. The enemy's at work while we sleep. You can be awake and alive as a Christian and be asleep to doing spiritual things. Amen. You do not want to be those type of people. And listen, this is what I feel like is what's most people's problem for living a godly life. You're not involved. You're in the grandstands. You know this is good. You're at the, you're at the game. But man, it's so much better to be in the, in the game and in this and, and live in this life. You know, anytime an opportunity opens the door, we have to capitalize. We have to capitalize. I want to bring a picture up really fast. This picture is a picture of a bus stop that's actually a smoke shack now out at Hanford. And this is where this is where I started praying years ago when I first got saved. Praying for people, praying for people in our building. Let's go to the next picture. This is what it turned into. Everyone in my everyone in that house is from Hanford and every hand raised is getting baptized that day. Next picture. This is everybody getting baptized. And we had motorcycles and barbecues and a big potluck and a lot of crying. People were giving their testimonies before they got baptized. And it was wonderful. We can live a life that is bearing fruit. One of the best compliments I ever got. I was witnessing to a guy and he's like, you're a real one. And this would be for a real one, like, you know, the homie. <laughs> this is before the real one. Like, I'm a real one. You know, this was like, you're a real one. I was like, real one what? He's like, you're a real Christian. I was like, really? Well, apparently I am. You got that right. And, and during sermon preparation, God told me to let you guys know what a real one is. And a real one is someone who takes responsibility for those around them. Can I get you this week, the rest of your life, to engage and take responsibility for that mean coworker, that bratty, bad spiritual atmosphere in your place? Can I get you to take responsibility for the kingdom of heaven and introducing it and interjecting it into your workplace, into your sports leagues, into your friend stuff, into the Friday night stuff? Can I get you to take responsibility? Help me take responsibility for the invisibles. I want to help them stop crying. I want to help people stop crying. Amen. Can the church get on board with that? I'm too shy. I don't like talking to strangers. Jesus didn't like dying on the cross. Who you want to compare? <laughs> I mean, come on, guys. My favorite scripture regarding all of this, 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 through 20. It says, after all, what gives us hope and joy and what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns, it is you. Yes, you are our pride and joy. The people that we bring with us are our pride and joy. They're our great crown as we stand before God. I want everybody to stand 